Good morning, friends. Uh, welcome to the GBC Sunday morning message. Mark asked me to share this morning, so I would like to share from the book of Romans. And today we're going to be talking about another secret of the Christian life. Mark spoke last week about the secret of contentment. And I want to talk about the secret of successful Christian living. Now, there are very uh, two very different ways of talking about success. There's the world's version of success, and there's a world's version of riches and wealth. And then there's God's version of success, and God's version of what really makes a man rich. And it's really the latter that I want to be talking about this morning. And it's, it's about how to live a Christian life where we experience victory over a lot of the sins that we struggle with, the victory over our flesh, being able to live with integrity and to live a life that truly represents Jesus Christ. As the Bible says, walk in the light uh, and not in darkness. And, and what that means, what does it mean to have fountains of living water springing up from us and having a life that is, that is full of truth and, and full of honesty and again, as I said, full of integrity. And so I want to look at Romans chapter 7. And I'm sure Mark might be getting a little bit nervous when I, when I mention Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 8, because we've only got 25 minutes and these are, are very theological chapters. But I'm not going to get into a lot of the theological things this morning. I really just want to talk uh, rather superficially, if you will, about some of the concerns and some of the things that Paul is addressing in Romans chapter 7 and in Romans chapter 8. But the context of these verses is to understand uh, about what Paul talks about. So in Romans, basically what Paul has done is he's touched on justification by faith. In other words, what he establishes at the beginning of Romans is the concept is, uh, of the fact that we can't be saved by our own works. We can't be saved by denying God. Uh, we cannot be justified in the fact that we deny God and say, well, there is no God, so I've got nothing to be afraid of. We cannot be justified by the law because all that the Lord does with regards to justification is proclaim us guilty and that we can only be justified by faith in Jesus Christ alone. And the word justification really is, is just a word to speak about the fact that when God looks at us and looks at our lives, he considers our lives without guilt. And so when we stand before God, we are justified in him. He sees Christ's righteousness in our lives. But what happens after that? And that is a question of sanctification. And, and again, another theological word. But sanctification talks about a life that is lived in accordance with the will of God and a life as Jesus Christ himself lived. And you see, the problem is many people, many churches throughout the centuries have perfectly understood and accepted the idea of justification. They have understood that you cannot get saved unless you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ for your sins. That was never the problem. The problem is what happens after this. And there are some that, for example, might say, well, therefore I'm saved. That's fantastic. I can live however I want to live. And in fact, Paul addresses that in Galatians chapter 5. He says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So what he says in this is, you've got liberty in Christ Jesus, but do not use the grace of God as an excuse to say, well, I'm saved and therefore I can live the way that I, I want to live. Because that has its own problems, which I won't get into today. Uh, and we, we see a lot about the fact that we, the Bible itself says, uh, do not be fooled, God is not mocked. What you reap, you shall also sow. And so for many of us, and I hope you listening and like me, you desire to live a Christian life, a godly Christian life. You desire to follow Jesus Christ in the way that you, that you want to. And so the, the concept, the theological concept here is, how do we achieve sanctification? And so for many, if I can put it in a different, slightly different way, for many the idea is Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins and he paid the debt of sin that was against me. So basically, I'm in foreclosure. Jesus Christ came and paid for the house and said, there we go, I paid for it. But now it's, I'm responsible to keep up with the down payments. 
And that's often with the idea that people have. Yes, Jesus Christ paid for your past sins, but for all future sins in a future life, you need to make sure that you live in a certain way or else you could lose your salvation or could lose your justification. And so the idea was for many, now that I've been saved by grace, how do I become sanctified? And Paul discusses that in Romans chapter 7, and that really forms the basis of what I want to speak, at, uh, speak about tonight, where he says in verse 50, For what I am doing I do not understand, for what I will do that I do not practice, but what I hate that I do. Even then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present in me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will do, I do not do, but the evil I will not do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who did it, but sin that dwells in me. I find in a law that evil is present within me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And so Paul, understanding justification by faith, now addresses his desire to walk after the example of Jesus Christ. And what he's saying in, this, in, this, in these passages is that the law could not only justify us, but the law also cannot sanctify us. In other words, when I try and follow the law, all the law can do, so, you know, love, love your neighbor as yourself, I love those who hate you, do good to, the, to those who are spiteful towards you, um, do not lie, do not steal. All of these things that the law tells us to do does not help us in actually achieving the law. And it actually makes sense. If I could live the law, then I could have been justified by the law as well. But all the law does every day is say, you are guilty, you are guilty. And in fact, trying to follow the law, trying to obey the law Every day I'm confronted with a flesh, my, my own sinfulness, and my own reminder that I am incapable of doing what Christ has called me to do. And Paul himself was faced with the conundrum. He says, I desire to do these things. I desire to follow the law. But there's another law working within me. The law of flesh and the law of death. And he says, a wretched man that I am. Who can deliver me from this body of death? And I'm sure many of us sitting here today can identify with that. How we desire to follow Jesus Christ. How we desire to live lives that, that glorify Him. That people could look at us and say, Man, this is a man over, after Christ's own heart. And we desire to be that, but every day we fall short. You know, maybe if you're like me, you, you've promised God that you're going to do better. You know, you study and you read the word and you say, Lord, I'm going to do these things. This sin in my life, you know, I'm going to deal with this sin in my life. It's not going to be a, an issue anymore. I pledge and I vow and I promise that, that I will no longer do this. And then what happens? Uh, a couple of hours, a couple of days maybe. And then we find ourselves falling into the very same trap, uh, tra uh, trap again. And we, we fail and we fall down and we're faced with this this hopelessness of saying, Lord, it is impossible for me to follow you. It is impossible for me in, in my power, in my strength to be an example of Jesus Christ. And that is what Paul found. And he realized that according to the law and in his own strength, he could not uh, lead that life. And in fact, he finishes with the, word, the words, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Now I want to be very specific about this, because this is a very important verse that is often misinterpreted. What Paul is saying and what he's not saying is what many people would refer to as dualism. So what he's not saying is, well then, I'm going to live my life, and you know, if I sin, 
then it's simple. I'm going to live a sinful life. I'm going to do whatever I want. And if anybody asks me about it, I'm going to attribute it to my flesh. So in my life, in my body, what I say, what I think, what I do, that is all based on my flesh. And so I live a fleshly life because what I can say and what I can say before God is, I know I'm living a fleshly life on this earth, but really my mind desires to serve you. So I've got this spiritual idea, that spiritual concept up there, things that I say, well, I've got this ethical thought, and there's a difference between ethics and morality. So I'm an ethical person. I'm just immoral. But the immorality I attribute to my flesh, and so I'm living this dual life as it will. That is not what Paul is talking about. What he is understanding, and this is very important to understand, is that Jesus Christ's work on the cross has not only justified me, but it's also sanctified me. In other words, God does not recognize the works of the flesh. And in fact, if you look back at Genesis chapter 25, when, when God is speaking to Abraham, he says to Abraham, Abraham, take your son, your only son. And if you're a student of the Bible, you realize that that's not, that's not absolutely correct. Abraham had another son, Ishmael. But what God was saying here is, I don't recognize Ishmael as your son. I recognize Isaac as your son. I don't recognize the works of the flesh. I'll recognize the works of the spirits. Take your only son, Isaac, and go. And so in many ways, what Paul is recognizing is that although we have sinfulness in our flesh, our flesh is dead in Christ Jesus, and therefore God does not recognize uh, the works of our flesh. But again, you would say, but Michael, that still hasn't answered my question. Just because, of the, because what you are saying is God doesn't recognize the works of the flesh, but I still desire to be spiritual. I still desire sanctification in my life. But Paul is about to answer that. And he actually gets into it in Romans chapter 8, where he says, There is therefore no, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So he sets in the first verse the idea of sanctification. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, if you are in Christ Jesus this morning, whatever sin you might have committed yesterday, whatever sin you might have committed five minutes ago, Jesus Christ did not only die for sins past, but his righteousness covers your entire life. And so when God looks at you, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he goes on to say, those who walk according to the spirit and not according to the flesh. And he's going to get into the next verse when he speaks about what that means. And we're going to answer that question with regards to how does the sanctification of Jesus Christ effectively work in our life? And the key to understanding that is, is a verse that we find in verse 2. And it's a law that many people do not often speak about. And it says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now that is a key verse. And that is a verse that I'd like you to underline or circle or whatever you do in the Bible. Because many people underline verse 1. And verse 1 is fantastic. There is no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus. That is great news. But verse 2 in many ways is even greater news. Because what verse 2 says is that there is a law working in our lives. That allows us to counteract or to supersede or to address the law of sin and death in our life. And that is the law of the spirit of life. What does that mean? Well, if you go back and look throughout the Bible, especially in Ephesians chapter 2, and I really urge you to go and read it, it talks about this resurrection life. It talks about the fact that the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is working in our members to allow us to live what the Bible would call a sanctified life, a holy life, a righteous life. I do want to say something before I get to it, and it's a little caveat and it's important. I'm not talking about an absolutely sinless life. 
Uh, if somebody says to you, I do not sin, then they are, they are a lie and the truth does not dwell in them, it says in 1 John. So for those who have who claim that they have reached perfection, that they live a 100% righteous life, uh, that is not true. Uh, there is no such thing as a 100% righteous life this, side, this life, this side of eternity, uh, unless you're Christ Jesus himself. So we will always have a degree of sinfulness. We'll always fall short of the mark of the calling of Jesus Christ. But I am talking about, as I mentioned before, a life of righteousness, of consistency, of walking into uh, walking in the light, and living a life that speaks of uh, integrity, that it speaks of righteousness, that speaks of a Christ-like life. So, how does this law of the Spirit of life work within us? Well, let me first explain it to you so that you understand the concept. There is a law in the universe called the law of gravity. And we understand that the law of gravity while we're on this earth cannot be overcome. We can jump, we can do whatever we want to. We find this, this gravity pulling us back to earth, much in the same way that our own flesh keeps us pulling us back into sin. But there's also another law. It's called the law of aerodynamics. And that law states that due to the flow of air over a wing, it is possible to overcome the law of gravity through enough thrust. You've got this air passing over the wing and you have an upward force on the wing that counteracts the law of gravity. That's a very simple understanding of aerodynamics. But the important thing is not to understand what is aerodynamics, is how is aerodynamics used. And obviously, the law of aerodynamics is used to fly us from one place of the world to another. Pilots, planes, helicopters all use the laws of aerodynamics to be able to fly. So every day around the world, aeroplanes and people are contradicting, if you will, the law of gravity. They're getting over the law of gravity. How? Through the fact that they've managed to use another law, the law of aerodynamics, to, to counteract it. And this is what the Bible is talking about. When it's talking about the law of the spirit of life, it says, yes, there is a law that dwells in your members. The law of sin and the law of death, this wretched man that I am that Paul speaks about. And so we've got this wretchedness, this failure in our life to live according to what Christ would have us to do. But there is another law. There is another power living within us namely the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, the resurrection life of Jesus Christ living through us, allows us to counteract the law of sin in our life and the law of death and to live life by the power of the Spirit and to follow Jesus Christ. So the next question is obviously, but Michael, how do I make use of this other law? In other words, how do I lie? Because, you know, people speak all of our time about let go and let God. Um, you know, you need to, to die to yourself and let Jesus Christ live through you. And it's, it's very hard to do because how do you not do something? You know, how do you die to yourself? What is the practical way to do it? And, and really, that is what Paul speaks about. And in fact, I'm going to go on through a couple of verses and, and I'll speak about it. He says, for the law that we could not, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. And again, the law wasn't weak in itself. It was weak in helping us in our flesh live according to its tenets. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the law uh, according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And again, we find the same concept in Galatians where it says those who, if you live according to the flesh or the spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And so walking according to the spirit is the way that the Bible speaks about us counteracting the works of the flesh. So how do we practically do it? Well, there's a numbers of, number of ways that we do it. Uh, and it's certainly not through trying to live according to, um, according to our own understanding of what we should be doing. So some churches, for example, get around this problem by saying, well, let's create easier laws. 
Uh, and this is called legalism. Let's create certain things that if people in the church do it, we will consider them living a righteous life. Obviously, that is foolishness. If God's law could not make us righteousness, then certainly legalism cannot make us righteous. righteous. So the first thing is obviously not to simply try and make uh, simple laws. The way we do it is a couple of steps, and I'm going to talk about these steps, and we'll finish with that five more minutes. The first thing is have faith that Jesus Christ paid for your sin so that you don't have to worry about it. That's a very important step. Because if you do not understand the peace of God, you'll never understand the grace of God. If you have not come to terms that in me, in my flesh, nothing good dwells, I can never in my own strength follow Jesus Christ. The Bible says without me, you can do nothing. Believe it. Do not try and prove God wrong. Because all that is going to do is lead to frustration and hopelessness. So the first thing we want to do is fully believe God when he says, without me you can do nothing, except that you're a hopeless sinner. But have faith that Jesus Christ's work on the cross has freed you up from sin in your life. So you can have faith and trust that you are sanctified in Christ Jesus, that there is no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. Once you accept that, then you can serve God from a free conscience and not constantly try to please God and try to um, make up for your sin or you sin and then say, well, God, what I'm going to do is a whole lot of good things to try and counteract my sin. Forget it. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ, death on the cross, paid for all of your sin. Have faith that that is true and rest in in his finished work on the cross. That is step number one. Step number two, allow that to sink into your life to appreciate the goodness of God. And this is a very important point because the Bible said it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. So once we understand that, once we rest in it, once we understand that every day I'm righteous before for God, I'm not trying to earn my salvation anymore. I'm not trying to be sanctified in my own flesh. I can, I can start living in praise and worship and thankfulness towards God every morning. Say, Lord, thank you that I live today in a clean slate. Thank you that all my sins have been forgiven and I can come to you and worship you and love you. This will give you a sense of gratitude towards God and understanding the goodness of God. And that is vitally important. Understand the goodness of God. Understand that the sanctification is there for you. Understand that Jesus Christ died for all of your sin and you will begin to live free from a guilty conscience and trying to serve and make up for your sin and you can simply enjoy a relationship and a communion with Jesus Christ. And the third step is spend your time just worshipping, loving Him, praising Him and looking forward to meeting with Him. And so the third step is now that has freed us up to have constant communion with him. So when we wake up in the morning, we praise him for what he's done for us. And then we say, Lord, help me to live this day. Live through me. It's very important to understand that resurrection life only works in dead people. And I'll say it again. Resurrection life only works in dead people. So you need to lay down your life. At the beginning of every day, say, Lord, my life is not mine. It is yours. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, unto thee. So we walk in that and we allow then just to focus on Jesus Christ in the day. So as we're driving our car, we're singing praises to him. We're listening to worship, not listening to the news. And we're just enjoying our time with him. When we get into work, our heart is filled with Jesus Christ. And we allow Jesus Christ in our life to speak to our colleagues and address our boss and we'll experience fountains of living water streaming from us. That is what the Bible talks about, living according to the spirit and living according to the flesh. And that is vitally important. When I live my life and believe me, I've lived in failure and I've lived in hopelessness and and I've, I've struggled through many, many things in my life. But I do want to finish with this. I have experienced success, I've experienced victory in my life by learning this very simple thing. I don't even focus on my sin anymore. 
If I sin, if I fail, I confess it. I look, I look unto God and confessing is just looking at my sin the way God looks at it. I say to God, Lord, I realize that what I've done, what I've thought, uh, this idea or this pride or whatever it is, I always measure my life not by the sin in my life, but I measure it by my walk with Jesus Christ. So really what I am focusing on every day is, Lord, how close am I, am I, am I to you? Am I reading my Bible enough? Am I spending time with you? Uh, what is our connection like? Um, have I had time to really engage with the Lord? Or has my prayers just become superficial? Uh, have I had time really to sit down with Him and experience His love and experience His grace and walk with Him? And that is the only thing I focus on. I don't focus upon my sin. I don't focus upon my failure. I don't focus upon trying to, to live my life according to the law. All I focus on, my number one thing, is mind the gap, as they say in, in England. Mind the gap between where you are and where Jesus Christ abide in me, Jesus would say, and you'll bear forth much fruit. Focus simply on that. So believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Be grateful and then walk with them every day. That is the secret of a successful Christian life. Thank you, guys. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. And Lord, we're thankful most of all for your finished work on the cross. And Lord, we pray for the church today, wherever they may be. Lord, we pray that you would set people free today from the bondage of trying to impress you and trying to live lives that, that would glorify you in their own flesh. Lord, help them to realize it's all about faith. It's all about gratitude. And it's all about walking with you. And in your precious name we pray. Amen. Have a fantastic week, guys. And I'm sure Mark is looking forward to sharing a message with you again next week. Bye-bye.